Good afternoon, and you're very welcome to this IIEA webinar event. And we're delighted to be joined uh, from Washington, D.C. this afternoon, this morning for our guest, um, by a distinguished uh, speaker, Alice C. Hill, who is Senior Fellow uh, for Energy and the Environment at the prestigious Council on Foreign Relations. My name is Alex White. I'm chair of the IIEA's Energy Group. In her latest book, The Fight for Climate After COVID-19, Alice Hill argues that the global response to COVID-19 can serve as a lesson for the urgency and the scale of the response that's required to avert climate disaster. She argues that mitigation is now no longer enough, that adaptation is clearly required. And we're going to explore some of those themes and obviously talk about the book a little. Um, and also, obviously, since we're so close to the conclusion of uh, COP26, we might reflect a little bit on that as well. And another theme, if we can get to it, will be the climate agenda of the Biden administration. So before I introduce Alice, um, let me briefly just outline uh, what today's format is going to be. We've had it just, just an hour in duration for the uh, full event. Um, initially, uh, there'll be an in-conversation discussion uh, for about 15 or 20 minutes or so between myself and Alice. Um, but of course, as always, we're keen to hear from you, from our audience. So please feel free to submit your questions using Zoom's Q&A function which you'll see at the bottom of your screen. We ask, um, as always, that if you're submitting a question that you would include your name and your affiliation, uh, the organization that you represent or you're from, if, if that applies. A reminder that the full session, the initial uh, conversation portion, and then the Q&A is all taking place on the record. And you can join the discussion um, also if you're minded to do so on Twitter, and if you're doing that, you can use the handle at IIEA. So our guest, Alice C. Hill, is the David M. Rubenstein Senior Fellow for Energy and the Environment at the Council on Foreign Relations. Her work at the CFR focuses on the risks, consequences, and responses associated with climate change. She previously served as Special Assistant to President Barack Obama and Senior Director for Resilience Policy on the National Security Council. Which, uh, where she led the development of national policy to build resilience uh, to catastrophic risks, including climate change and biological threats. Prior to this, she served as senior counselor to the Secretary of Homeland Security, where she led the formulation of the department's first ever climate adaptation plan and the development of strategic uh, plans regarding catastrophic biological and chemical threats, including pandemics. She is the co-author of Building a Resilient Tomorrow, uh, 2019 publication, and author of the Fight for Climate After COVID-19, as I've mentioned earlier, which is just published this year, 2021. In a previous life, um, Alice mentioned to me earlier that she was a practicing lawyer and indeed a judge and has taken a close interest in many of the, the legal uh, uh, ramifications and uh, uh, dimensions to this uh, whole climate agenda. So uh, we're delighted, Alice, to have you. Uh, this afternoon and let's just get going i mean in your book you you argue that the global response to the pandemic can serve as a kind of a lesson or i don't know prototype or a, 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 some you know a go-to experience for how we can deal with the climate emergency and it struck me and um, it's, it's a little bit of a i suppose a cliche at this point but a former colleague of yours ram emmanuel had you know coined this great phrase uh, not wasting a crisis and i'm wondering is it perhaps a little bit different this crisis is different from the one he was talking about which of course was the financial crisis but i mean are there is it a, is it a version of that sense that look we're we're picking things up now we're learning things now let's see what we can do to uh, to 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 make things better and to improve our approach to the climate agenda but anyway that just occurred to me as something that he had previously said but what do you what, what's maybe just elaborate a little bit on on some of those basic uh, arguments that you're making well, yes, uh, thank you so much for having me. I'm just thrilled to be able to join you. And I think Rahm Emanuel, who was President Obama's first chief of staff, definitely got it right when he said, never let a, essentially, never let a, a good crisis go to waste, is I think how he phrased it. And uh, of course, we can learn from crises, and that's often how we see 
great leaps forward in preparedness. Uh, we saw that using examples from my country after 9-11. Certainly that event shocked us uh, and our anti-terrorism efforts uh, just completely exploded. We reworked how we did government uh, to respond to that. And we've seen similar events across history where cataclysmic occurrences motivate populations to do things differently. With the pandemic, we're having a catastrophic risk that affects everyone. And although it's uh, very concerning, terrible, it can yield lessons for another catastrophic risk that is already unfolding and probably will lead to even more damaging impacts than the pandemic. And that is, of course, climate change or the warming of the atmosphere, which is causing these big events, bigger floods, longer, deeper droughts, extreme heat that can kill uh, in, within hours uh, and uh, just climate strange events. Uh, one of our columnists called it climate weeding, weirding, where we have Arctic blasts occurring in Texas, causing our electric grid to fail. So we're seeing that climate change is already stressing society. And these two threats share some similarities. Both pandemics and climate change impacts are borderless threats. I had never really heard that before, but when I was working at the Department of Homeland Security, this huge sprawling agency created after 9-11, uh, we were talking about uh, biological threats. Does it make sense to close your borders to keep biological threats out? We never really answered that question uh, where there was a recognition that you can't keep them out. And that's what we've seen with the pandemic, but you might be able to slow the spread. Uh, so we, I learned that all these jurisdictional boundaries that humans have so carefully crafted are essentially not going to apply when you've got either a pandemic or now with these big events fueled by warming, rising temperatures. We also learned that early action matters. You can look at the different experiences of different nations to see that those who acted early on the pandemic had better outcomes. Similarly, that would be true of climate change and leadership and planning matters. So my hope is that we would study and think about and learn from the pandemic and start applying these lessons so that we can have a better future together as temperatures continue to rise. I think that notion at that point about borderless, you know, that it, this this agenda has, has got to transcend borders. I mean, self-evidently, I mean, that recognition, I suppose, at some level was there back in the 90, in the early 90s when the UNFCC, you know, came into existence. But of course, the sovereignty of nations and sovereignty is still such a dominant, uh, a, you know, fundamental truism of human of, of 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 global life and of the interaction between states but it's interesting uh, perhaps we'll come back to that if we if we get a chance as to you know the 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 enduring importance of sovereignty and how difficult it is for us to, to perhaps get 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 around that frankly in 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 terms of the inter sort of actions that are needed internationally but just on 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 the let's sort of stay positive for the moment i mean or, or if we can i mean we've come out of cop uh, we saw some advances there. We saw some undoubted disappointments there. I think everybody, any, anybody would ha have to agree that there were, we saw both, um, and it's a stage along the way. Political will. Now you're, you've had the um, advantage, the privilege of being uh, of being able to observe closely what happens in the White House and what happens at the highest level politically in the U.S. Um, so we had the Obama administration, the two administrations, then the Trump one, and now back to to President Biden in terms of of the the approach. I mean, how important is political will, and is that political will something that's growing? Do you think, or does it still have to be fought for? Well, I think political will is important. Going back to what Rahm Emanuel said, and political will can occur as a result of events because then you have the political support uh, to give politicians the will to make the hard choices. 
Um, but the challenge with climate change, in my opinion, is that we will have, unlike the pandemic, we won't have a single event uh, mm. that causes um, people to rise up and say this has to stop. Instead, we see these impacts come in on a very localized basis. And uh, speaking from the United States, there's still a lack of understanding that uh, these events have been fueled by climate change to the extent they're uh, greater extremes than we've ever had before. So we have to assume that people begin to understand that and then that they will act on that. But climate change comes in peril by peril. It doesn't come in across the board. It's very geographically localized. So it becomes more difficult uh, to get the political action to address the overall problem, which requires mitigation, of course, the two sides of climate change, at least mitigation, cutting the harmful pollutants that human activity is sending up in the atmosphere, forming that blanket around the globe, trapping the heat and warming us all, warming everything up, and then with these impacts following, and then adaptation. So adaptation is to prepare for and respond to the impacts. Uh, but we just, it's hard to get the political will for the mitigation and on the adaptation, it's hard to get the political will to address all the range of threats from climate change if, if you haven't experienced it yet. And some of this goes back just to human cognition, how we understand risk. Uh, and so that will be a challenge for us going forward. Uh, more events will add more political will, in my opinion, uh, but we still have uh, deeply divided um, understandings of what's ahead and until we can get a better across the board appreciation for the threat it's going to be harder to make progress and the political cycle i mean god we see the political cycle in the us because everybody observes what happens there but the political cycle is reality everywhere um, and so, you know, fourth elections that are coming will will prey on the minds of politicians who are trying to be reelected. And um, so just the points you made a moment ago that there may be goodwill, but there may be a sense then of not, not being able to, to take the big steps that really are needed because of the political pressure that will come back from the electorate and the risk of not being elected. So I was going to ask you actually, you know, mentioned about the legal end of things as a, a terrific um, a really interesting judgment of the German Constitutional Court this year, earlier this year, and it kind of touches on your point about the intergenerational, but you know, we, we know what needs to be done, but um, we don't really kind of have the political um, room or, or, or possibility to do it, and, and politicians then sort of they, they kind of sit back and they, they let events flow, whereas what the German Supreme Court said, no, no, Young people alive today in Germany are likely to face a very drastic constraint on their freedoms in whatever, 20 years time, 30 years time, if we don't do something now. And they characterized the rights that those young people who had applied in that case, they characterized those rights as um, intertemporal rights. In other words, there were rights which, a right to a future, which, you know, the threat to which is, is not gonna crystallize for quite a while, but it's, it still works in injustice to those young people today because there's a certainty of a problem for them tomorrow when many other people won't be around. So I suppose the point is slightly academic point of one's of the German court, I think got it because it sort of tried to cut through this political cycle, this electoral cycle and to say, no, no, you've got to do something now that avails those young people because otherwise they will be affected adversely in the future. And it's a, it's a, it's a way of, I suppose, the legal system may be going behind the, 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 the drawbacks of the political system and, 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 and the, uh, the, the, the political cycle and the electoral cycle. Well, you are seeing some very interesting developments across the globe. Uh, the case you mentioned, we also have the case uh, in the Netherlands uh, mm. with the Royal Dutch Shell, and then we have the case um, uh, in Pakistan, where uh, Pakistani government is told they're not doing enough, we also have bubbling along here in the United States, 
uh, lawsuits brought by cities um, and by children saying against both fossil fuel companies for uh, causing emissions that then cause these harmful pollutants that then cause uh, these impacts. Uh, and then cities suing um, because they're suffering these impacts. Uh, it's uh, quite a legal debate in the United States uh, whether um, this is an issue that is more appropriately left to the legislatures uh, mm -hmm. rather than to the courts. And that same uh, dynamic that you've just described is, is underlying all this. Look, the because we're politically divided and because of a lack of uh, politicians having the support to make these choices, we're not making them and that's putting everyone at risk. Uh, but as a former judge, uh, for many judges, that's uh, not something they see as their role to step in and um, uh, craft solutions. So I think we will see great tensions along the way on this and probably ultimately will have to be uh, resolved in our Supreme Court. Yeah. So, um, but it's, it's hmm. go ahead, yes. No, 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 it's interesting because that issue, exactly the tension, as you say, policy is not for judges and they, they shirk that as you, as you rightly say. And that's the same in our tradition here. But we had a very interesting Supreme Court judgment last year, um, Climate Case Ireland, where those questions were addressed. And when the Supreme Court came down and said, no, look, we don't make the policy, but if you set, meaning the government, if you set certain targets and if you say you're going to do certain things and you have legislation solemnly declaring that you're going to do, and then you don't do them, or you bring out a plan that's inadequate and that is just manifestly not matching up with what you yourself have said you will do, well, then it, we, we will intervene. The courts can intervene. And, and that happened in Ireland as well in a very interesting case. But let's come back because, again, just, I suppose, looking at the, the broader global geopolitical context, if I, if I can put it that way, I think you, you wrote at length in a number of different uh, outlets in advance of, of COP, that if we didn't get the kind of political leadership that we're, we're looking for, that there will be a very real possibility of increased geopolitical tensions um, surrounding climate action. So now that we're on the other side of COP, um, do you want to assess the outcome of COP in, in the context of your, your concerns about possible geopolitical tensions if people didn't step up? Or if, if there was continuing conflict perhaps between countries as to what should happen? Well, yes, at the COP, um, I think the UK president of the COP and held in Glasgow, and I, I did have the great privilege, privilege of being there for the full two weeks. I think he summed it up well. Um, we have a goal that the scientists told us should be our goal. We really had the goal since the Paris Agreement in 2015, but uh, in August, this very important report was issued by the International Panel on Climate Change, a group of scientists who reviewed 14,000 peer-reviewed scientific articles. We had over 230 scientists from over 60 nations they poured over these findings and they issued an executive summary. The report in August was quite long, I think over a thousand pages, but the executive summary is uh, far shorter. And that summary importantly was agreed to by all the member nations of the UN uh, Framework uh, Convention on Climate Change, the UNFCCC. That's 197 nations. So every one of those nations agreed to this executive summary and the summary said, we have to keep below 1.5 degrees of warming since pre-industrial time. So that was a big goal coming out of the uh, COP26. Um, and that goal remained intact. Uh, but uh, as the UK president, Alex Sharma said, uh, the pulse is weak. And the danger with that is of course, then uh, if we blow past that 1.5 degrees, the scientists have warned us that we will, will be in territory that human civilization has never experienced really catastrophic threats to ecosystems to our built environment uh, and the possibility of tipping points where very dramatic events happen very suddenly that are extremely difficult for uh, humans and uh, other living things to prepare for. So um, we don't know where we'll be, but that means that there's additional pressures developing because 
there is doubt whether we can contain our heating. Uh, and if we can't, the, I think there are two uh, things that we'll need to watch for. First is there's going to be growing emphasis on geoengineering. It's almost as if there's now a third side to climate change. You have mitigation, cutting emissions, adaptation, preparing for these damaging impacts, and now geoengineering. And geoengineering is essentially major interventions in the climatic system to try to control the heating. And things like solar radiation management, uh, where you're putting particles up in the atmosphere to deflect the sunlight. It's um, putting silica beads on the Arctic to slow the, the melting of the Arctic ice to slow um, heating. It's putting cloud, um, cloud, changing the cloud coverage so that we can um, slow heating. So we're seeing far more of that move forward. We have no international system or understanding on how that should be governed, and it could simply be done by a billionaire or by a nation state. So that's a separate area developing. And then we have uh, the impacts will be getting worse. And if our adaptation efforts find fall behind and uh, the developing world is uh, vulnerable to climate impacts, it's not equal how these climate impacts fall. And they also don't typically have the kind of infrastructure that you would find in a developed nation, say levees, seawalls, uh, drainage systems to protect themselves. So they will be suffering ever more damaging events, and that is highly destabilizing to governments. In fact, at the COP26, for the first time ever, the UN General Secretary of NATO um, gave a talk on national security and climate change. And there's just a recognition that the security threats will grow because the humanitarian needs are growing. You know, since 1970, we are now experiencing five times more disasters than we did in 1970. So we're seeing huge uh, humanitarian needs, uh, greater food insecurity, water insecurity. Uh, and as those things unfold, um, they can topple governments, uh, they can give rise to authoritarianism. Uh, and these are issues that we uh, are only beginning to come to grapples hmm. with, but we saw it during the pandemic. We saw rebels in Yemen saying it's uh, using the pandemic to recruit. They said it's better to die as a martyr uh, than it is to die at your home and COVID. We saw El Chapo, the car uh, leader of the Sinaloa cartels, daughters passing out hand sanitizers, the mafia uh, was trying to help local populations. So this is a, a point of vulnerability for any government if they can't adequately respond to these worsening, damaging climate threats. And actually picking up on the, I suppose, by way of analogy, again, the COVID, the lessons of COVID, one of the things that's often said about vaccines in the COVID context is that no one is safe until everyone is safe. You know, that sense that it, it's a collective, by definition, it's a collective effort. Um, and similarly, if it's not stretching the analogy too much, isn't it the case that internationally, I mean, self-evidently is the case that no individual country can stabilize the climate. I mean, no matter how powerful a country is, no matter what resources, it, if, if, it, if, it, if it thinks it can do the job within its own borders, it's, it's greatly uh, mistaken because we're, countries are territories are dependent on other territories. You, you, I mean, there are many countries that are you know, downriver of other countries that, you know, you mentioned water, that there are all sorts of inter interdependencies going on. Um, and isn't that one of the great challenges that perhaps wasn't really quite met, wasn't met at all in, 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 in Glasgow? The need, the, rec the need to recognize that, you know, financial transfers will be, will be necessary, that there will be many countries in the eye of the storm that won't be able to afford the infrastructural development that you're talking about. There'll be other countries that will be in a better position to afford it for itself, but they need to, those countries need to think about helping those, uh, helping the countries that are in the eye of the storm because of these necessary interdependencies down the line. Well, this was a, a brewing issue before the COP. Yeah. Um, I wrote a 
piece about uh, watching the finance at the at the COP, and in fact, yeah. it emerged as a big uh, point of contention yeah. and disappointment uh, yeah. coming out of the COP for the developing world. Of course, in 2009, the developing world promised the develop uh, the developed world promised the developing world that they would mobilize they would um, get enough finances a hundred billion dollars a year by 2020 the developing world uh, did not honor uh, that representation and by it's difficult to calculate by 2019 uh, they had only given about 80 percent and importantly from the perspective of the developing world much of that came in the form of loans. And if you mm -hmm. think about the balance sheet for the developing world, they're hit by the pandemic. They already face, because their credit ratings are lower, they face uh, higher prices for uh, bar borrowing money. And then they've had to shell out just huge amounts of money to help their populations deal with COVID. So they're, they're in precarious finances and then the help on Climate change comes in the forms of loans, so that's not as uh, helpful to them. And then it's mostly for mitigation. It's mostly mm -hmm. to help them um, get electric grids that are not emitting. But these nations, as you pointed out, need a great deal of help with adaptation. In fact, the UN says that currently the needs of the developing world for adaptation run at about $70 billion a year, and that by 2030, it could go up to $340 billion a year. So the uh, developed, developed world had trouble coming up with $100 billion, and most of that went to cutting emissions, not to these things of adaptation, which would be uh, helping them uh, with their flooding cities, the many cities on the coast uh, that will need either stronger protections or better planning going forward. That, that help didn't come as much. So uh, it will be going forward a continuing point of contention. And of course, the developing world also wanted greater progress on the issue of loss and damage. And that's a related concept, but essentially it's saying, hey, you developing world have caused most of this climate crisis. We, uh, the developed world has caused it. We, the developing world, haven't had much to do with it. You should pay us money to help us deal with this problem you created. And of course, as a judge, I can appreciate the liability argument that's underlying that, saying you caused it, you should pay for it. Uh, but so far, that issue has been kicked down the road. Uh, what came out of the um, COP26 was a promise for a future dialogue on mm -hmm. or dialogues on the issue of loss and damage. So this is going to be um, a point that will be revisited many times over. And ultimately, if you look at the security risks that fall follow from a failure of governments to be able to cope with climate change, uh, there may be long term thinking that needs to be done to why it's in our interest to make sure that countries um, can help their populations thrive at home uh, so that they're not bad actors uh, recruiting uh, more to their ranks or we see the kinds of migration that is predicted with climate change. Migration, just a whole other part of the agenda, uh, obviously. Just to remind um, our audience, please feel free to pop in a question um, if you'd like to do that. And uh, I'm sure we'll get, have an opportunity to get. I know we've, we've got a very good attendance. And it's nice to see that. So um, you may pop your question on the Q&A any time that um, it, they, they occur to you. Can I take you back, uh, Alice, just to the States, just for a moment, and just to look at, we touched on it earlier, the Biden administration um, in office now for, what is it, a year? You lose track of time and pandemic. Yes, right? just about a year, <laughs> January 20, right. Yeah, so how are they doing on, on, on climate? I mean, it, it, the benchmark of um, President Biden's immediate predecessor may, may not be may not be a great one in the sense that like you'd be you you certainly would be expecting it expecting it to be a lot better than what happened then. But doesn't it need to be many times better? 
uh, to make progress. How do you think he and President Biden and his administration is faring in this agenda? Well, look, we have never had a president more focused on climate change than President Biden. He's made it a central pillar of his presidency. Uh, we uh, announced, uh, he announced immediately after taking office that the United States is back. Of course, there's a lot of cleanup uh, that has to occur uh, from the Trump administration if we want to make progress on climate change. Uh, essentially, President Trump uh, rolled back many of the efforts that had been accomplished under President Obama, those uh, in the ruling back meant that he sued and or he took action unilaterally and then, uh, for example, environmental groups brought lawsuits saying you can't do that. So a lot of the work that President Obama did is tied up in the courts um, based on what President Trump did with that work. Uh, and then uh, we have a, here a president who's brought in more people uh, than ever focused on climate. You know, I visited Canada in 2016 and I had a remarkable experience. I'd just been come out of the Obama administration and you almost found no one with climate in their title. Uh, it, climate was still viewed as kind of a polarizing issue. So they would have different words in their title, even though they might've been working on climate. Uh, in Canada, I found under uh, Trudeau, uh, many people had a climate in their title, and that's what's happened with Biden. He's he's said we are a climate team, and uh, advisors, uh, special assistants, all have climate in their uh, titles and in their portfolios. So there is extreme. Uh, effort being driven from the executive branch to address climate change through whatever executive actions can be taken. But you point out uh, there are headwinds here and the headwinds uh, are most noticeable when you talk about how divided our Congress is and it's really divided or we as a nation are really divided when it comes to climate change. Recent polling has shown that at least 70% of Americans understand or identify climate change as a problem. But uh, if you drill down on that, um, you see that there's a stark difference between Republicans and Democrats. Uh, in the last seven years, the percentage of Democrats that think that climate change is a serious threat has gone up uh, to 95%. So if you're Democrat, you're worried about climate change. But during the same period, the share of Republicans, and we're in a, obviously a two-party nation, the share of Republicans who say climate change is a serious problem dropped by 10%, and it's just at 39%. And then you move over to our Congress and our Senate, and we need both houses, We, I mean, both um, uh, the House of Re Representatives as well as the Senate to pass legislation. Our Senate is split 50-50. There are only 100 people in the Senate and 50 are Republicans, 50 Democrats. And so we need to go to the vice president to, to um, break a tie, but we can't, a lot of our legislation requires 60 uh, votes to pass in the Senate. So it's a big challenge trying to drive a climate agenda through. Uh, and you see that right now, if you follow in the United States, where uh, President Biden is pushing a bill under a parliamentary rule that allows for only 50 votes or 51 votes to get through. Uh, and um, that would have much of the bulk of the climate provisions for the United States. It looks like that'll pass, but it's been a challenge. We just don't have an electorate uh, and our split in how the representatives are in Congress have not uh, allowed either President Obama or uh, President Biden to be able to just simply drive through legislation easily. It requires more work. So that slows things, uh, but I think the Biden administration is firing on all cylinders to get these uh, things done. It's it's a high priority. Everyone recognizes the threat it poses uh, to our country, our economic health, to our prosperity and our uh, public health. And then it 
it's a global issue, as you've said. We need to work with other nations to come up with a solution that keeps the entire planet safe. Emily Binchy, uh, thank you, Emily, for your question. And um, Emily, thanks you for your very interesting uh, presentation. And, and asks, given the great disparity in historic emissions, you did touch on this already, but perhaps just to delve into it a little bit more, given the great disparity in historic emissions produced by developed versus developing countries, how optimistic uh, would you feel about the prospect of achieving climate justice and climate solidarity globally? So as I say, we, we have touched on it, but this is to bring back it. Look, where, where do you start? Are you optimistic that this can be achieved given this great disparity that's there? Well, I'm an optimism. I think most humans are. That's how we get. Uh, I'm an optimist and that's how we get through life. Uh, my hope is that these issues can be resolved, but I'm also um, try to uh, exercise discipline in thinking through these issues. I think it's going to be a very large challenge going forward because the developed world is also going to be suffering from these impacts. Uh, and you need to develop the, or you need to have the political will, as we've said, uh, to talk about the kinds of transfers of capital that might be involved, uh, particularly when we're talking about investments in adaptation. Investments in adaptation uh, simply don't have typically the rate of return that you get, for example, for investments in clean energy. Um, it's not as obvious how you're going to make money uh, from investing in a mangrove forest to uh, store carbon and protect against storm, storm surge. Uh, there are ways to do it, but it's more complex. It also uh, doesn't have an easy metric uh, like you do for uh, mitigation, avoided tons of carbon or whatever other greenhouse gas emission in the atmosphere. Uh, measuring adaptation and resilience is just harder to do. We don't have a worldwide metric for it yet, uh, so it makes it less attractive uh, for financing and uh, figuring out public private partnerships in this space may be more difficult. So uh, that will uh, be a challenge. Uh, the developing world will be having growing needs, uh, but also the developed world will be suffering from impacts that they want to spend capital on. Mm. So that's the big fear. If you look at the war gaming and there's been war gaming and, and other types of gaming done on this for over, over a decade, um, it shows uh, there was a game done, I think, in 2007, 2008, where uh, former diplomats and others are assigned roles as leaders of different nations. And um, this was run by the Center for Naval Analysis. Uh, and it showed over time, looking at the progression of impacts coming in, that the developing world um, demands increased, but the developed world began to pull back. They got tired of humanitarian rescues. They got tired of the demands for money and they turned more insular uh, and turned towards uh, just tending to their own populations. So uh, I don't know if that will occur, but that's what we have seen. And that can give rise to authoritarianism um, and other challenges, as I've mentioned. So. Um, this is a big issue going forward, and we don't have the answers yet, and COP did not give us the answers. I'm interested because it is a central theme of your book, The you know, because we, 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 much of the debate is about mitigation, and you're saying, no, look, we've got, we've got to be talking about adaptation a, a, as much equally, if not, I don't know if you think more so, or whether they should both be on the same track, both be on the same level of, of focus. I mean, isn't it hard to sometimes, although it's becoming, I think, a little easier, but isn't it generally difficult to keep the focus on the climate agenda? And is there a risk that if we, is there a risk that if we have to fire on two different cylinders, as it were, the mitigation and the adaptation, that we, we risk one distracting from the other in the public mind in terms of people's ability, their, their sort of bandwidth to, you know, to cope with the problem and to be able to address the problem if, you, if they've got to address both. I don't doubt that they do. We do have to address both, but it's in terms of the public focus, I'm wondering. Well, there is a divide in the world between mitigation and adaptation. And when I say the world, I mean the experts that are in that world. Um, and I think that divide currently is hindering our pro progress. 
because if you don't consider how mitigation is affected by adaptation or vice versa, you are at risk of making some decisions that will be viewed as uh, not so wise in hindsight. Uh, and this divide is, um, is longstanding. Uh, and, and when we first really started working globally on climate change, climate change was viewed as something in the far off. And you know, here in the United States, people talked about it in terms of polar bears. It was something for 2100. Well, climate change has now arrived. It's arrived with a vengeance. You can pretty much look out your window and see evidence of climate change. So it's happened faster. Uh, that's probably one of the most remarkable things that I learned during COP was the consensus, it seems, among scientists I spoke to. Wow, we just are surprised, not about how it's unfolding, but that it's unfolding so quickly. So it's happening quickly. And so this uh, decision to not talk about adaptation for a variety of reasons, it might concede that we failed on our mitigation efforts. Um, it might distract, as you said. Uh, I don't think we can put off that conversation anymore. And uh, no question, we need to mitigate. We need to cut our emissions to avoid unfathomable uh, catastrophic changes to uh, the planetary system. So no question, we need to continue in full force on that. But to preserve our economies, our public health, we also need to embark on a, a adaptation. If we don't do both, um, we risk the failure in adaptation causing uh, communities to crumble, causing really abrupt uh, economic disruption that make it difficult to achieve our goals on the mitigation side. So we need these two to work together. And then importantly, we need to consider whether a choice made, in, let's take in mitigation, can have um, some negative impacts uh, on adaptation, and I'll just pick one uh, for this example, be solar energy. You know, in Australia, in California, we've seen solar energy just explode. Of course, there's a challenge with solar energy. First of all, you need battery storage, so you have variability, but it turns out that when you have wildfires, solar energy the production of energy plunges because as you have a big wildfire this happened both in Australia and California, the smoke makes it difficult for uh, the sunlight to hit the panels then and it also causes soot to hit the panels, so the production plummets and what happens then. A lot of people go out and power up their diesel generators or they power up those coal plants that are sitting uh, as a backup and that can undermine the whole calculation about what you're going to achieve with solar. So you need to account for that. A flip side would be um, a, a decision on adaptation that can negatively affect our mitigation efforts. So um, one of the things I remember vividly in the White House was sitting around a room talking about water security and how can we increase water and somebody piped up. Oh, well, let's just build more desalination plants. And we've seen an explosion of desalination. That's when you take salty or briny water and you turn it into fresh water. Uh, I think we have 18,000 plants across the world. Well, it turns out to do that, to take salty water, uh, seawater, and turn it into fresh water, takes an enormous amount of energy. So if you're not thinking through, we need to use clean energy to create that fresh water, you've greatly added to your problem of heating up. And in fact, in, uh, I think it's Saudi Arabia, they spend about 25% or use about 25% of their oil production on desalination efforts. So we need to think through how these two efforts can work jointly uh, so that we're, we're not harming progress on in one area um, so that we can achieve progress in the other. And that is not happening in my experience at any level of scale. These two communities still remain separate and another hard challenge for us to work on, but we need to correct that as well. Luke O'Callaghan White, who's a senior researcher at the IIEA, um, take you back to the domestic politics um, in the US on this question, but also a policy, I suppose, a policy difference as between the US and Europe. Uh, Luke says, given the broadly partisan and deeply entrenched 
divide in Congress and the challenge of passing any climate or environmental law without reconciliation, do you think that President Biden could successfully introduce a price on carbon over the next three years of his administration? Well, that's something that certainly the United States has struggled with. Um, President Obama, in his first term, tried to get towards a price on carbon. Uh, we don't have the re reconciliation bill done yet, but certainly uh, there have been representations that it could be included in there. Um, at least one senator has said he's has got has forty nine votes in the Senate. Uh, he needs uh, the fifty, then he'd get the vice president as well to get there. So that could happen. Um, and then you saw in uh, just in the G20 negotiations, um, the EU and the United States coming to agreement essentially to to work on, it wasn't a resolution, but um, some kind of carbon border adjustment tariffs for uh, steel to try to incur, and steel of course is one of those industries that it's very hard to cut the emissions that result from the production of steel. So to encourage um, green steel, uh, they are uh, agreed uh, to work on whether they would have some kind of system for that. So I think you'll see more efforts developing to um, try to get to some kind of pricing on carbon, uh, but I. I don't know yet how that will ultimately play out, uh, but the administration has certainly signaled that it's looking for other ways to uh, drive consideration of the carbon emissions in different uh, areas of industry. Alex Conway asks whether you might like to comment on the moves, some recent moves that we've seen by big international firms like Shell and Unilever their moves to more flexible jurisdictions like the UK and away from the EU um, in response, it would seem, or arguably in any event, is partially to the strenuous climate regulations and obligations imposed on them. Um, and how can we avoid a corporate race to the bottom for climate regulation? Good question. Well, this, uh, I can't comment on that particular uh, situation. I haven't followed it closely enough, but I can tell you that this is a concern because there uh, is growing interest in the EU. You're ahead of the United States, but uh, interest in regulation of disclosures of climate risk uh, of um, for corporations to um, include and inform their shareholders of the transition risk. That's the risk, what, what will happen to their assets, for example, if uh, we go to clean energy, as well as then the risks to their operations, their supply chains uh, and their facilities from climate change impacts like more flooding, more heat. Uh, so we're, we're, I expect in the United States, we will see regulation coming out of um, the regulatory agencies uh, on this issue. But one of the um, flags of that approach, and I am in favor of regulation, and uh, is that um, we could see responsible companies just selling off their assets, uh, their heavy emitting assets uh, to less responsible companies. And this is something that Larry Fink, he's the head of BlackRock, uh, it's the world's largest uh, uh, investment manager. He, he, they manage over um, $8 trillion worth of um, investments. And his point is, as we go through this uh, drive towards regulation to get greater transparency on the theory that that will fall force corporations to consider more climate risk and uh, be better stewards going forward, that we we could see a sell-off uh, of particularly dirty assets to people who are less uh, interested in the greater goal of, uh, of achieving, controlling uh, emissions, and they just want to make as much money as they can. I don't have the solutions to that, but that will be a challenge. But I still believe that we have at the highest levels, we do not have full understanding and the polling on this issue shows or the analysis on this issue shows this as well. Uh, our corporate leaders and, and some of our government leaders don't have a full understanding of what's at stake with climate change. 
So regulation would force that into the boardroom to make sure that corporations have the proper risk management measures in place to avoid uh, sudden um, uh, sudden sell-offs or other uh, challenges that could have resulted as climate change worsens. Mm. Um, I suppose coming back to to your book and I mean again this com comparison or at least this you know what can we draw on the COVID experience into the future in re in relation in, in respect of climate. And it occurred to me just today or these few days, there's a lot of discussion in this country, and I know it's the case elsewhere too, about this in COVID, in relation to COVID, the question of coercion, that's maybe a strong word to use, but, you know, coercive measures such as lockdowns, for example, probably the most extreme, versus encouraging responsible behavior. So we've, this is a recurring motif, I think, in all of the debate about COVID. You know, can we can we encourage people to do the right thing, whether it's vaccines or, you know, social distancing, all of the things that we're, we're hoping that people will, will, will do or avoid doing as the case may be to try to prevent the spread of, as, of COVID. So does this debate, libertarian debate about, you know, it's my body and I have a vaccine if I decide I have one, I, if I don't, I, I won't. And then the more collective um, perspective that many people would have. So if you apply that to climate, and we, we spoke about the carbon, the carbon tax a moment ago, I'm interested, do you have a view about the balance that's going to be necessary between coercive measures, and I use the word coercive in a general sense, um, versus people just deciding that it's in their interest to do the right thing? Is that going to be is that going to play into the politics of this issue domestically around the world as well, where governments have to decide whether they're going to force change or just encourage change? Well, I do think that that uh, issue will arise. Uh, what comes to mind is uh, managed retreat, uh, which has now become those two words are dirty words uh, when combined in the United States, and that's. Uh, the challenge that you have, for example, on coastal in coastal communities where um, we know going forward uh, land will be lost to sea level rise. So those communities um, may have to relocate uh, houses, roads, infrastructure, and um, there have been calls for planning to make sure it's not a chaotic withdrawal from these areas, but in fact it's a planned uh, relocation or moving back from dangerous areas. Uh, this has proved in, an, in recent times, very difficult issue for most communities to manage. Uh, we had in California, very dramatic instances of this uh, you know, along our coast. We have a very long coast along California in the West. And there's a California Coastal Commission, a state-run commission that's responsibility to make sure that the public access to the beaches in California remains. So they have some regulatory authority over what happens along the beaches. And they uh, instructed uh, communities to come up with uh, a plan for what they're gonna do as uh, sea level rise occurs. Um, and um, one of the cities, probably one of the wealthiest cities in the United States, home sell for well over a million dollars. Uh, not that large a city, maybe um, 3,000 homes affected or something, but um, the city, the residents said, wait a second, you're talking about managed retreat. That's going to be terrible for our property values if we're talking about having to move back from the coast. We don't want to do a plan like that. And they voted the plan down and they voted any discussion of it down. Um, and we've seen that in other communities. So we don't have uh, the vocabulary. We don't have the means yet to address the fact that um, change is coming. It's coming quickly. Uh, and but when you're talking about people's homes, uh, where they have deep emotional attachment, this is a extremely difficult discussion. Um, and I don't know how it will come out. Right now, we have not 
used coercive measures. We've mostly used voluntary measures, um, voluntary buyouts, for example, of homes that are at risk. But this will be an ongoing challenge to figure out how do we um, help communities be aware of their risks and then make choices that are uh, choices that are acceptable to their communities. Thank you. We're coming towards the end. Um, uh, I'm going to give our audience uh, one more chance opportunity if they would like to add a question just before we finish. It'll have to be a quick one. Um, but while people are thinking about that, um, Dara Moriarty um, asked a question, I suppose, post COP26. It, you know, we've discussed some of the pledges were made, there was disappointment, there was some progress in some areas. Back to this focus on young people, Dara asks, you know, given how important young people have been in, in pushing the climate agenda, um, what, what would you say to keep young people motivated and engaged? Um, President Obama had something to say about that, I think, in the last few weeks when he was addressing that. I'm not sure, was he in Glasgow or at least around the time of that? No, he, he was in Glasgow. Yes, yeah, he was, a, he was addressing, point. yes. So yeah. what's, what's to be said to keep young people motivated when they see that the progress is painfully slow? Well, I am. I do worry about that. I worry that the young people are going to become too discouraged. And in fact, there was a poll not so long ago of about 10,000 young people uh, covering a number of countries across the globe and nearly six in 10 from the ages of 16 to 25 were very or extremely worried about climate change and felt their governments were not protecting them, the planet or future generations. Um, and the issue for us is how can we make sure that young people want to be engaged? Uh, and um, I, when I speak with young people, I, I encourage them uh, to really learn about climate change because it will uh, be the defining issue. It affects everything. That's the challenge with climate change. It affects virtually every natural system or built systems. Uh, cuts across all disciplines. We've talked about law, engineering, architecture, health, the economy, you name it. And so get some expertise in climate. And the other thing I try to convey is, look, this is an enormous challenge. None of us really knows what to do. No human civilization has ever experienced what we are going through, this rate of change in our environment uh, and with the risks involved. But what I find in working on it is incredible excitement opportunity for innovation. It's changing so quickly. And if you become a part of it, and the psychological studies tell us this, you feel far more empowered. That engagement gives you uh, the motivation and the um, drive, and it brings you satisfaction and purpose uh, as you're a part of it versus standing uh, off on the side. So I urge everyone figure out the angle that you're interested in and then start thinking about how whatever discipline sector or uh, line of work you've chosen how it will be affected by climate change and then what are the solutions to reduce the risk that climate change poses to how we've been doing business in the past because the past is no longer a safe guide for the future um, and i find so much reward in this work i'm hoping that uh, they can too no question. And we are coming up on the hour, so I'm going to bring proceedings to a close and thank you. Thank Alice Hill for being with us um, this afternoon, this morning. Um, Alice Hill's book, The Fight for Climate After COVID-19, is published by the Oxford University Press. Um, there's um, several dozen leading uh, comments. I'm just looking down the list of our audience this afternoon. And thank you all for joining us. And uh, many of the leading commentators and uh, uh, players um, in this field uh, have joined us and that's great. Um, I think your book, uh, congratulations on the book you mentioned has been translated into Chinese um, and I'm sure amongst many other languages too, but thank you so much for being with us uh, to discuss some of the themes of that book and also to range over uh, such a wide area. Um, thank you very much and thank you all for your attendance this afternoon. Thank you. Thank you.